Amen. Thank you, worship team, for leading worship for us every week. Uh, I love getting to come here with you guys and sing songs of praise uh, to our God. Even just that, sl- la- that last song, singing holy, 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 worthy, worthy, worthy. Uh, that is the primary reason why we come here, is to worship Jesus. And so I'm glad to be here with you guys and worship Jesus also by hearing from his word. And so if you guys want to grab your Bibles, uh, if you don't have a Bible, we have some in the back uh, that you can run back and grab if you'd like. And open up to 1 John where we're continuing in our series called If You Know, You Know. And I'm sure you guys have probably heard that phrase before. Uh, I actually, fun fact, didn't even know that there was like the, uh, the, the lettering for that that you guys text to each other. I just like knew it was a phrase, but nobody's ever texted that to me ever in my life. And now I'm learning all about it. So if you know, you know, and we are talking about, as we study through the book of 1 John, the simple idea that if you know what it's like to be changed by Jesus, see the fruits of a relationship with Jesus in your life, then you know that you've been saved by Jesus. That's what we're talking about. And that's what John talks about as we go through 1 John. You know, I love the, the comment that uh, Avery and Olivia mentioned at the beginning. They said, hey, you guys wouldn't even be in here if we didn't open the doors for you, so join the Impact team. Uh, that's a little plug to join our serve team if you guys would like, but it's so true. Man, if we didn't have uh, our serve team and people to come here to open the doors for you guys, we wouldn't even be able uh, to come in here and worship the ways that we do, and so I'm very thankful for the people that, that serve every Sunday. And you know, as we come in on Sundays, uh, we as just common people, uh, if we're all honest, we like to come in and bring our best self, don't we? Like whenever we get out of bed, roll out of bed in the morning, we go in the bathroom, like, ooh, like fix ourselves up and then show up wherever we're going. We bring our best self. We're going to wear our best clothes. We're going to act our best. Like that's just what we do. And, and often when we come to church, we bring our best self. And one of the things that John is going to point out as we look at God's word today, this morning, is that even when we come in with our best selves and here in church and we all do this, the reality is that that is not all that the Christian life is about, is it? Because the truth and the reality of the Christian life is that we are all, uh, even when we bring our best self to places, we are all, deep down, we, we all have a little bit of mess in our life, don't we? We're all a little bit of a mess in progress. John is gonna talk about how the Christian life is not as put together as many people think. I, I think when most people consider Christianity in the church and churchgoers, they think of really put together people who have everything together in their life and all they, they know what they're doing. But in reality, we all as followers of Jesus are just like everybody else. We all have a little bit of mess in our life and, and, and we're all in progress. John jumps into the beginning of his message by reminding us of that. And, and we're going to see that here in a minute as we read God's word. Because the truth is that behind every one of our cleaned up church going self is, again, that mess in progress. You know, we all have areas in our life that, that we're kind of fine with not posting on social media. Like we're fine with not being public because we don't want to talk about it. We don't want other people to know about it. Sometimes this mess in our lives can often lead to a lot of confusion. Um, it, can, it, it can lead to a lot of burden and weight in our life, a lot of stuff that we might just keep in the secret closet of our life. And what John is going to talk about is he's going to say, hey, don't forget that that is present. And, and that's a very present reality in the life of following Jesus as each of us follow him. But then he's not just going to leave us there. He's actually going to give us the solution to those things. What John is going to talk about is the biblical model of confession. How we take that mess and we bring it before God. Like, what, what do we do with these things in our life? When we do have a mess, when there's things in our family life, in our personal life, that, that is not all put together like we may want it to be, what do we do with those things? How, how do we handle those biblically in a way that God wants us to? That's what, excuse me, that's what John is jumping into here uh, as we read. So with your guys' Bibles open, Let's go ahead and read where we left off last week in 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 5. And John says this, This is the message that we have heard from him, Jesus, and we proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. 
But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. God, thank you so much for your word. Lord, would you just give us hearts and, and, and ears to hear and receive and apply uh, your word today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, oftentimes... We don't know where to start, like I mentioned, uh, when we come across these messy things in our life. John, John mentioned that. He says, hey, we all have this in our life, and we often don't know where to start, especially when it comes to confession. Confession can sometimes be this thing that is confusing, or we're not sure quite what to do about it. We hear about it in church that we should confess our sins, bring them before God, but what does that actually mean? And yet what John teaches us here is that confession... It's actually a pretty simple start, pro, starting process because it doesn't have anything to do with us. But the start, where confession starts, it starts with God. See, because we will only see our sin clearly, John says, when we first view God rightly. And that's our first point for today is that we will only see our sin clearly when we view God rightly. You know, knowing God is actually the key to knowing who you are. If you know who God is, then you will know who you are. We will never be able to accurately understand where we stand morally, like how good we are, if we don't first accurately understand who God is. You know, if I were to ask you each the question, do you think you're a good person? Do you think you're a good person? How would you respond today? If I were to ask you that, what, what would you say? What would you point to? How would you respond See, in all honesty, when we have to answer that question, in order to answer that question, we all have to look to some kind of standard, right? We got to find some kind of standard or measurement to look for to figure out where we land on that moral scale when considering that question. Before even addressing us, John actually, he gives us that moral standard. He gives us that form of measurement. This is what he says. He says, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. See, before he even talks about us, he actually points us up towards God. Throughout the Bible, uh, light, as John says God is light, it's actually a symbol of things that are pure and righteous and good. Anything that is pure and righteous and good, that's what light is described of uh, as mostly throughout the Bible. And so what John is saying here, he's saying that the God that we worship, he is light in essence. He's saying that God is, is pure righteousness and goodness. He is the top of the top, the best of the best. You cannot get more gooder, if that's even a word, I just made it up, than God. He is pure goodness and righteousness. And he also says that there is no unrighteousness. There is no ungoodness, that's also a made up word, in God. He's both perfectly good and he has no unrighteousness, no darkness within him. It's impossible for God to have any wrong in himself. See, and yet the reality of our human nature is Paul, or as John is saying, hey, we need to look to God first. The reality of our lives is that we don't look to God first as our standard when considering that question. Most often when you ask people that question, or even we consider that question, the first place that we go to is anything or anyone but God. We're going to look everywhere other than God, mainly, because we, we don't want to look bad, do we? By nature, we actually want to look better than we are, or we don't want ourselves to look as worse as we are. That, that's our nature. We, we do that. Think of it this way. Imagine as if I were to take you to the local goat farm. How many of you guys have seen those like memes where the goats are screaming and yelling? They're like my favorite meme ever. Uh, Imagine if I took you to the local goat farm and I stood next to one of those goats, those screaming goats, and said, I made the claim. I said, I am 
the greatest singer of all time. And you hear this goat screaming his lungs out, and then I sing a song for you. Now, I've taken some choir classes back in high school, so I'm not like the worst singer in the world, but I'm the greatest. So say I'm singing next to, next to this goat, and I make that claim. You're going to be like, well, pff, compared to that goat, you're not that bad. Uh, you're you're pretty decent singer, okay? Then say I were to take you to a church kids choir. We all love our church kids choirs. Half the kids don't even know what the heck a note is, so they're just belting out, and it's great. And I were to sing in the kids choir, still make that claim, I'm the best singer in the world, and I'm singing in this kids choir. You, you're probably listening, and you're like, okay, well, you know, these kids, they're, they're still very much so maturing. Your voice cracked a little bit like them, but you're, you're still better than the kids. I mean, yeah, you're a pretty good singer. Okay, then say I were to go try out for American Idol. And I show up, now they probably would never let me in the door. But if I did get in the door and I tried out, they would probably boot me out in a second uh, from when I started singing because there's no way I'm equipped to that show. And you would very quickly be like, yeah, he does not belong here because he is not as good as he thinks he is. Right? There's always those people going, on, they think they're the best singers in the world. That'd be me. And then say, and then say we're at an Ed Sheeran concert together. We're listening to Ed sing his songs, and man, he's ama- one of the best vocalists in the world, in my opinion. And you're standing next to me trying to sing his song. You're very quickly going to realize Connor is not a great singer. He is nowhere near what he thinks he is. And I share this with you guys to essentially give you guys the understanding that as we see the further I work my way closer to the highest standards, some of the best singers in the world, the quicker you realize and the more evident it becomes how far away from the greatest singer in the world that I actually am. See, we are people who are prone to compare ourselves, to make us feel better or keep ourselves from feeling worse to everything other than God. Standards that make us, again, look better or keep us from looking worse. We compare ourselves uh, to someone who gets a worse grade than us so that we can feel a little bit better about how we did. Or we highlight the flaws in someone else's performance, say, on the, on the court or on the field after the sports games to, to keep ourselves from being, say, the reason why we lost the game. Like you try to blame it on other people. And the reality is that this same mindset itself, it falls into the realm of sin in our life. When messiness and sin comes up in our life, we apply the same mindset. Like, think of how many times that we've said or thought to ourselves, well, at least I didn't do this. Or at least it wasn't this bad. Or, eh, you know, it's not that bad because everybody does it. Or mine's not as bad what, say, that person did. See, there's a reason, John says, why we do this. And it's because, he says, our view of God is off. We don't view God as we should. Because in order to see sin for what it truly is, we must first compare ourselves to the perfect standard, God. He's the one who we should be measuring ourselves by. And the truth is that we don't like to compare ourselves to God because, in all honesty, when we acknowledge his holiness and his perfectness in our life, it it, it, brings to light the areas in our life, even the smallest, that are wrong and don't, don't make us that, look that good. John describes God, again, as the God who is light. His holiness, his righteousness, it shines so bright that it reveals even the darkest and the, the tiniest of blemishes in our life. John essentially saying that to claim both to know God and to be a good person They don't fit together. They're they're incompatible with one another. He says that you would actually be calling God a liar because his very nature and his word tells us that we are not by nature good people. So John, he points us to God. See, we want to feel good about ourselves and we don't like to address our faults often. It's honestly pretty scary to look to God with our sin because it forces us to admit things about ourselves that we don't like to admit or we don't like to address. But that's just it. John doesn't stop there. He says, this is the beginning of what it means to walk in confession with God, but, it, but it's also the moment in which we understand more of who God is that actually brings us to want to confess things like sin in our life. 
See, it's the moment that we look to God that we both have to admit that, yeah, we aren't as good as we think we are, but we also get to admit the truth of who God is and his heart for us as sinners. That he's a God who wants and is actually waiting to forgive us. God is a God who is wanting and waiting to forgive us who are his people. See, God wants to bring us, to, to bring, he wants us to bring our sin before him because his heart is to display, put himself on display, his grace and his mercy in our lives. That's what he wants to do. Look at 1 John 1, 9. John says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, God is faithful to forgive us in that he has never and he never will shut off access to his grace. He is always wanting to put himself on display by showing us grace and forgiveness. He's not only promised this, but he's actually proved it in Jesus. He's proved that he's faithful to forgive. God is both faithful and he's also just to forgive because he sent Jesus to take on himself the penalty of our sin and pay the price that our sin required. Jesus was the way that God was faithful and just to forgive. See, God's desire is that we would grow closer to him and further and further away from sin and confession. That's what John's talking about here. He's saying that Jesus, he died and rose again, not only that we might be saved, but that we might be changed by Jesus day by day and we might look more like him. See, but God knew that even in this process as followers of Jesus, as we follow Jesus as we seek to be changed, it's a hard process. He knew that we wouldn't be perfect at it. God knew that we would still struggle and make mistakes. And so his way of dealing with this dilemma was by providing what John calls an advocate here. Look at verse one through two in chapter two with me again. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you might not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He's the propitiation or the one who paid the price for our sins and not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. See, what this means is that when we bring our sin before God, he can actually say, I have already forgiven you. I've already forgiven you because look back, Jesus already paid the price. It means that when God looks at us, even in the midst of our worst mistakes, our messiest points in life, he doesn't see our mess any longer but he sees Jesus' holiness and his righteousness that Jesus gave us when we trusted in him. You know, John himself, as we talked about last week, uh, he was really close with Jesus. He actually walked with Jesus. He talked with Jesus. He was a friend to Jesus. And in Jesus' lifetime, John actually recorded one of Jesus' most well-known parables today. It's the parable of the prodigal son. And it's in this parable that John actually records Jesus portraying this father and this son. There's actually two sons. And gives us a picture of God's heart for us. Many of you guys probably know it well. It starts by sharing how there were two sons and a father. And one of the sons, what did he do? He took his father's inheritance, didn't he? Took the money from his dad. He said, I want it now. And he went and he squandered it. He spent it on all these things and lived this reckless lifestyle that ended up leaving him in a pig's pen, eating pig slop. Ruined his life. Totally disgraced his family. Dishonored his father. Got to a point in his life, he's like, there's no way my dad would want me back. But eventually he came to his senses on this day. And it says this in Luke 15. Jesus tells his story. It says, but when he came to himself, the son he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I am perishing here and hungry, sitting in this pig, sten, pig pen. He says, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He says, this is what I'm going to tell my father. And then it says, he went, he rose, and he came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him felt compassion, and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly 
the best robe, put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring that fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. I mean, notice how the father in this story doesn't respond how we often respond as people when others hurt us. He doesn't hold a grudge against his son. He doesn't remind his son about all the things he did. He, I can't believe you took my money. You ran away. You were gone forever. He doesn't point out all of his issues to make him feel worse or make sure he's sorry. And he doesn't tell him it's too late for forgiveness. But what do we see the father do? We see him run towards his son. It says while he was far off, the father ran after his son, met him before his son even made the front door. He reached out, he embraced his son before he could even speak a word. He clothed him. He threw this massive party for him. He even kills big Bertha, puts him on the table and says, let's party, let's have a great time. His father embraces his son. See, this is the heart of God towards us when we sin. This is what Jesus was revealing. Oftentimes our sin, when we, when we really mess up, it can lead to thoughts such as, I can't, I can't go to God with this. This is, this is way too big. It's way too bad. Or this is, this is too much for me to be forgiven of. Or oftentimes we just think that, man, I, there, there's so much guilt with this. I, I think I just need to leave it. I just need to turn away. And I just need to, I need, to, I need to not think of it ever again. I should just do nothing about it and it, eventually it'll go away. These can often be our thoughts in those moments. And any one of these thoughts would have kept the son in this parable from running back home if he sat on it. If he, if he kept this thought in his mind that I can't go back to my father, I, I can't, he, he will never show me grace, mercy. This is too much, I've done too much. He wouldn't have gone back home. We can often face thoughts like this that keep us from going to God and, experiences his, and experiencing his love for us in Jesus. You know, it's often our own feelings and our guilt and our shame or our belief that God is one thing when he's really not that keep us from him. Later on in 1 John, John actually talks about this. In chapter 3, he'll, he'll go on later and he says this. He says, by this we know, we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. He knows everything about us. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. See, what John's saying here is that God, he's far greater than any feeling of guilt or thought of shame that comes to our mind when we're at a low point. He is greater in that he has already proven to you and to me that we have reason to be confident, to be confident to go back to our Father, even with our greatest failures, not because of anything that we've done, not because of anything in of ourself, but John says because of the truth of who he is, of who God is, and what he's done for us in Jesus. He both is and has proven that we can go to him with even our greatest of failures. You know, when you're in a spot, and I've been in these places before, where your guilt is just keeping you from God, Maybe, again, something that happened to you, something that you did, a, a situation in your family, wherever it might be, and, and it is keeping you from God, you know that that guilt is not from God. The Bible talks about two different kinds of guilt, one that is from God and one that is not from God. And if there's any guilt that keeps us from God, we know that that's not from God. Now, God wants us to come to us with his sin. So he, he does allow us to experience and, and give us this conviction, this guilt over the things that we do that are not honoring to him because he wants us to bring it to him. You know, knowing this about God, that, that he is wanting and he's waiting to forgive us, what it should ultimately compel us to do 
is exactly what John says we should be doing if we truly do know Jesus, know his heart towards us and have a relationship with him and are walking closely with him, walking in the light. He's saying we should walk in the light by regularly running to God in confession. It's who God is that should bring us before him in confession, actually admitting to God what he already knows, right? It's admitting to God what he already knows about us. Even as followers of Jesus, like I mentioned at the beginning, you and I don't have everything together, for being honest. Even though we try to. We try to act like it, we try to portray it, but the truth is that we don't. We will wrestle with sin. We will fall at times. And what matters most is what we do in response. That's what God is wanting from us. He wants us to run to him in confession. See, confession is this amazing gift that God has given us. That we can go before him with even our greatest of mess. And like I said before, he can say, I've already forgiven that. We, we can remind ourselves of the things he's done for us in Jesus. We, we can come before him and experience his forgiveness. We can experience gratitude. We can grow in love and gratitude towards God, knowing that he still accepts us as his son or his daughter. It's this tool that God has given us that is actually the catalyst for change, something that John is going to jump into next week. He's going to talk about the obedient life that we should live if we truly have a relationship with Jesus. But before he goes into that, he says confession is the spot that we first need to be in regularly with God if we're ever going to get to a point of change. Because confession is so powerful that when we go before God, it's that moment that we actually increase in our love for God. We get to experience his heart for us and realize how much we want to follow him that then allows us to get back up and, and, and love him greater than we love our sin and the other things that we want to do outside of God. Now, I want to end today just by walking through four different kinds of people. When we talk about biblical confession, where, where are we at in that? Like, how, where am I at in relation to where I should be? And these are four different types of people that you're most likely one of these people and or struggle with at least one of these first three. The first one is the hider. Maybe you're here and you're the hider and you conceal and you ignore sin in your life. You're somebody who, man, when mess comes up and, and you, you do things, you, you experience this guilt and this shame, you, you, you push it under the rug. Like, like you put it in the closet, you don't want to think about it, and you're definitely not going to address it. You're not going to talk about it with no one, you're not even going to consider it for yourself, and you don't want to do anything about it. You're just going to ignore it and leave it there. Maybe if you're this person, the next step that John is saying to get to the point of confession is that you need to, you need to bring yourself before God. You need to go take that and, and bring it before God because like he said, it's when we view God rightly that we're clearly going to see our sin and see that we can't just ignore it and we can't just conceal it, and not talk about it. Maybe you're here and you're not necessarily the hider, but you're the fixer. You're the person who will hide it you don't want to talk about it because that's, that's weird and, and I'm not comfortable bringing these things up and say life groups with other people or my parents or anybody in life. I don't want to talk about it, but you're not necessarily going to not do anything about it. You're going to try to take action and you're going to try to fix it on your own. You don't want anybody else to be a part of the process, but you're going to hide it and you're going to try to fix it on your own. You're going to do it yourself. And often what happens if you're this person is you'll experience this great weight and this burden of trying to live the Christian life on your own. Fight through sin on your own, not bring anyone into it, even God. It comes with a weight. And what John is saying, if this is you, is that you can't just conceal and do it on your own, but the Christian life is meant to be done with others. James actually talks about it. For those of you guys who are sitting on main service, we're going to get there. In chapter 5, James says, we are to confess our sin to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ and pray for one another that we might be healed. See, we were never meant to do the Christian life alone. And so maybe if you're here and you're the fixer, your next step towards 
biblical confession, walking in the light, is to go tell someone about it. First and foremost, bring it to God, but bring it to people in your life who you trust. Bring it into the light because you can't do it on your own. Maybe you're not the fixer, but maybe you're the talker. Maybe you're the kind of person who you will talk about it. You'll bring up your mess and you'll, you'll sit in groups and, and, and life group and you'll share like, hey, this is going on in my life. This is really hard. This is the struggle that I'm facing. And you'll talk about it and you'll receive encouragement. You'll receive prayer and you'll gain that affirmation that you're looking for. Like, oh, that feels really good. But then you leave. You leave life group and you don't do anything about it. Come back a month later, you're sharing the same thing, receiving the same encouragement, prayer. You leave and you don't do anything about it. If this is you, your next step would be to start acting on sin because Jesus doesn't just call us to bring our sin before God and, and, or John's not just saying bring it before God and confess it, but he's saying you actually need to change. We're gonna talk about that next week. See, true biblical confession always ends with a changed life, what we call repentance, which leads to the final person, the repenter. This is the person that John is saying that we should all be if we're walking in the light. Somebody who is both confessing our sin, we're bringing it up to those around us who we know and we love and we trust, we're following Jesus together with, we're bringing it to God, and then we go and we do something about it. Because if you know what it's like to be changed by Jesus, then you know you've been saved by Jesus. John's saying if you see that change in your life, then you know God is at work in your heart. So my question for you guys is simply this. Which person are you? Which one of these people are you? Now I just want to end today by inviting the worship team to come up. I want to give you guys a moment in prayer. And what I want you guys to do is to consider Consider the areas of your life that, again, we get to come in here every week and we act like we have everything together, but in reality, each one of us, man, we have things that we need to bring before God. We have things that we need to confess to him and do it in the ways that God has designed for us to do. And so maybe there was something about God, a truth about him that you're reminded of today. Or maybe there is an area of your life this morning that, came to mind that you need to bring before God. I want you guys to bow your heads and close your eyes, and I want to give you guys a minute. For maybe this is a time for you that you can just remember something about God, truly his heart for you, and thank him for that. Or maybe this is a time for you where you need to bring some mess before God. You need to confess some sin. Ask for his forgiveness and believe that he's faithful and just to forgive you. So I want to give you guys a moment to do that, to either confess and or thank God for who he is. So go ahead and do that now. God, we thank you so much for your goodness and for your grace in our life. God, thank you that you are much greater than any sin or any mess that we could ever bring before you. God, thank you that you are a God who does not just ignore us or leave us in our sin, but God, you have pursued us in Jesus. You've made a way for us to be right with you forever. And God, have confidence to come before you, even like we're doing right now, to bring sin before you and know that you love us that you are wanting and you are waiting to forgive us and that your heart is of grace and of mercy and kindness. So God, we thank you for that. And God, we just take this last moment this Sunday to bring you praise and glory and honor and worship as a response. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you guys wanna to get to your feet, we're gonna sing one more song, Lord, I need you to worship him in response.